Hello and welcome to episode number 68 of Flat Earth and Other Hot Potatoes. With me is a man who you know by his first name or by his, um, his username on YouTube. His name is Bob and it's going to be a show all about Bob. Let's welcome Zana Dude from Glowbusters to Flat Earth and Other Hot Potatoes. Hey Bob, how are you? I'm doing just great, Patricia. How are you doing today? I am happy to have you here with me. I've been talking about having you on for the longest time, and finally, here we are. Yes, it's been a while. Um, yeah. I think you asked me, what, last uh, December or November, something like that? Seems like it. Seems like <laughs> it. Well, you're the voice that's not really seen that much, so. That's true. I did one uh, channel promo, uh, I don't know, a month or so ago. Uh, it was the Meet Bob thing, and uh, everybody's like, oh, geez, it's Bob. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> And I know your wife, Cammy is somewhere in the background. Maybe she'll pop in and say hello, hello at a later time. That'd be nice. Yes, she will. Absolutely. All right. So you guys live in Denver, right? We do. Yes. How did you first get involved with YouTube? With YouTube? Well, I don't know. That's, it's kind of hard to say exactly when I got involved with it um, because I've you know dealt with computers my whole life. And uh, so... I would say that uh, I opened my account, I think, somewhere back in around 2007 or 8, something like that. And uh, I just uh, really didn't do a whole lot. I, I would comment on um, videos and stuff like that. And then when I was researching uh, NASA, um, I kind of ran into the flat Earth topic, and here I am. <laughs> so what were you looking at? Same thing as me, the moon hoax, uh, astronauts gone wild, funny thing happened on the way to the moon, that sort of thing? Yeah, I was looking at that, and uh, I was a big follower of Richard Hoagland, um, mm. you know, years ago. And, uh, you know, I was pretty knee-deep into the whole Sedona thing and Mars and the 19.5 and everything. And uh, I started wondering, why is it that, that everything that NASA seems to do uh, is looks like it's fabricated? It just doesn't look real. And so for the longest time, I researched that and uh, probably was researching that for three or four months um, before um, I ran across Flat Earth, and then it kind of occurred to me, it's like, wow, I wonder if this has anything to do with it. And the more I started looking at Flat Earth, um, the more it just seemed to make a whole lot of sense. And uh, then everything just kind of fell into place after that. And you and Jaron started talking early on, and then you were on his channel, Jaronism, before Globusters was born. Now you are on Globusters, and you're going into your second season, and it includes yourself and Jaron and the Morgyle, so it's going to be all three of you. How did you first meet Jaron, and how did the whole thing come uh, about where you and the laser, and it's a, uh, it's, I know we haven't been in Flat Earth that long, uh, but it's a, it's like a legendary story, really, I think. Yeah, well, um, I saw I was I started watching Jaron because of course he has the same name as my son, Jaron. They just spelled a little bit different. Uh, my son Jaron is J A R E N and Jaron is J E R A N, and I just thought, oh well, this is you know meant to be because I'm a big believer in in uh, uh, kismet or whatever mm -hmm. things that are meant to be. And I said, hey, this guy's great, and I really liked his uh, uh, sense of humor, and uh, loved the way that he put together videos. So. Um, I was watching a video one day and he put out a call uh, saying, hey, if there's anybody out there that has a little, you know, handheld laser, um, if I could just borrow it from you, that would be great. I would, uh, you know, pay the shipping and whatever. And I just thought, you know what, I really want to help this guy out. Um, I love his work. Um, I love his uh, attitude. And so I uh, wrote him an email and I said, hey, um, you know what, I'd be more than happy to buy you a laser. Um, and send it to you because I really want to help out. And so he was, he responded and he was just ecstatic about it. And so uh, I sent him, I did some shopping. Unfortunately, I should have shopped a little bit better. Of course, that's a little bit deeper story. So I did well, some who, know, who, who would know about the, the beam expanding and all of those things, you know? Exactly. And, you know, I've been in electronics my whole life, but so a lot of people would have thought that I would have known about that, but uh, I really didn't work with lasers that much. So anyway, um, I was looking for, uh, you know, the best laser I could buy for a decent price, and I found one, and uh, it was a one-watt laser, which was fairly powerful, a lot, lot more powerful than the, one, uh, than the little uh, laser pointers that they had out. So I said, hey, I found one that's going to be great. You know, this thing will work, you know, a couple miles, several miles easily, and I sent it to him, and uh, 
um, he started doing the tests and the rest is kind of history. I remember one of his videos, I don't know if I recall it exactly, but he was in his house and he was uh, showing how powerful the laser was and it yes. was pretty amazing. And I remember when he did the laser test as well, I was not a YouTuber then, but I was watching this unfold on YouTube. I already was a flat earther, but I hadn't decided to make videos yet. And I remember when uh, we lost touch with Jaren, or we not we, I didn't even know him then, but as the audience, we felt like, what's happening? There's supposed to be a laser test, and Jaren and Miss are out of communication, and it was just this big, one of the early dramas, not in a negative way, of uh, of the YouTube world, and people posting on Jaren's. I was even posting on his uh, Facebook, like, are you okay? As if I knew him, because it's weird how you feel you do know these people uh, after spending so much time listening and to them and in some cases watching them and having that closeness based upon the connection of flat earth and yes. yeah so it was Absolutely. great though though the, the what you did with the laser uh helping out like that and you know i didn't know who you were or anything but i thought wow that man that's a good person a good human being somebody who really is searching for the truth and is willing to put his money on the line and help out somebody he doesn't really even know in person and send them a laser like that and i don't know i just thought it was great so Oh, Liked was, you from the start. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. I was happy to do it. Um, and yeah, I was. I remember that day very well when he was doing the, the laser tests out there. And of course, his battery died. And um, <laughs> his phone, um, yeah. You know, even back then, you know, the, the people that were not exactly fans of Jaren, um, you know, were giving mm. him a hard time about that. Yes. And so. Yeah, they were saying, why didn't you charge his battery? It was charged. But when you're doing any kind of line, live streaming and you're somewhere without a plug, um, yeah, <laughs> and you don't have a backup battery because it's just nothing you've never experienced before. I don't own a backup battery for my iPhone. I don't even know if there's such a thing. But yeah, I'm sure there is something you can plug in. But you don't think about that when you're ready to go doing something like that when you first do it. Yeah. You just think, I'll go out there, I'll shoot the laser, well, it'll be cool. And then before you know it, you know, you're somewhere on one side of a water and your wife is somewhere on the other side and you've lost communication and... Yeah, well, anyway, we all know how that came out. And, of course, so. Jaron, you know, on Jaron's site, he was he was there with a the photographer that he paid uh, mm -hmm. something like $200 for. Right. And uh, they're just kind of standing around, and it, it wasn't dark enough, really, to shoot the laser off um, across. And uh, then they had, you know, little problems here and there. Yeah, they're but, using uh, the, f the battery on the phone the whole time to record it, waiting for it to get dark enough. Yeah. And the funny part was, is, you know, when everybody was worried, um, I actually got on the on the phone and called the uh, Monterey Police Department <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, talked to, I think it was Officer Hawkins or something like that. And they were really, really cool about everything. You know, they said, oh, well, you know, do you know where he is? And I didn't really know the name of the beach, but I was guessing. And uh, so... Jaron told me, you know, a little bit later on, he goes, yeah, we were sitting there trying to figure out what to do. And, and this cop pulls up and he's like, oh, my God, here we are. I'm busted, you know, because we're shooting <laughs> the laser off. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, that was pretty funny. But uh, he managed to, to salvage it, you know, the next day, um, even though he had the, the huge beam divergence problems. So. Right. So the test was a success, actually, in the end um, and did prove what he wanted to prove. It wasn't ideal at all, but uh, it was successful. Right. because he started shining it on the ground and Missa could see it. And well, it, uh, as I said earlier, all can be found on Jaren's Jaronism channel. And it's really, although we're a very young group of people, I don't mean age wise, Bob, <laughs> but young flat earth in flat earth. Uh, it's really sort of one of the early legends of flat earth in, in modern times, that story with the laser, Jaren and the laser. <laughs> so yes, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I want to hear more about you and electronics. Now, I've, I've seen you uh, talk about and heard you talk about all of the different things that are part of your background. And you're a fascinating and brilliant man. I'm not complimenting you. I'm just saying it how it is. When I listen to you, you just come up with stuff. And I say to myself, how does he know that? But it's because of your background. Tell us a little bit about your background. Okay. Well, um, I... Uh started out i guess in electronics uh all the way back in junior high i was very interested in electronics and uh, my dad was a ham radio operator and uh, he was also very much into electronics and he would always build little test projects and intercoms and uh you know whatnot he would uh design them and build them himself and so i became interested in electronics also and by the time i was i believe 14 
um, I had obtained my uh, amateur radio operator license and uh, by the time I was 16 I had actually got my amateur extra class license which is like the highest license you can get in a ham radio and I was still in uh, high school at that time and then uh, uh, after that, I obtained what was called a first class commercial radio broadcasting license. And you may be familiar with some of your people, the engineers that have that certification. Yeah, I never had a first class license. Yeah, yeah. You guys just had to have like third class licenses. Yeah, I was only licenses. licensed to talk, not to work on any towers. <laughs> right, right. So, so yeah, I got the, uh, I was still uh, 16 or 17, I think, and I had gotten the first class commercial. And then uh, shortly after that, I went into the Air Force. In fact, I was still 17 when I went in the Air Force. My parents had to sign for me to get in. Wow. And uh, I went in there and uh, was uh, at Lackland Air Force Base for basic training. And then I was stationed at Keesler Air Force, ba Air Force Base, um, which is down in Biloxi, Mississippi. And uh, there I was uh, what was called a 303, which is uh, an air traffic control radar technician. And I wasn't the guy that actually worked the radar. I was the guy that did the installations, the troubleshooting, the repair, um, the setup, um, did a lot of uh, TDY temporary duty um, to a lot of different uh, Air Force bases and facilities installing these things. And uh, so I uh, did my stint in the Air Force for four years. and. Uh, got out and immediately started working uh, in the electronics industry. I've had several jobs uh, as an engineer, uh, was going to school uh, at the same time uh, to uh, get my engineering degree and uh, started working for different companies. Uh, and then uh, at one point I worked for a company called Western Telecommunications. And uh, what I did for them uh, was I set up all the um, uh, satellite uh, ground uh, technical operation centers is what they're called. Uh, did that for a couple of years and then after that um, they started a project where they were subcontracting for Sprint, subcontracting, excuse me, for Sprint, uh, MCI and a couple other uh, companies where we would build um, 10,000 channel uh, analog and digital microwave systems um, all across the country. So for the next uh, couple of years I was, you know, young man, I still was barrel, it wasn't even I was just over 21, I think. Um, so I uh, got to travel all over the country. It was fantastic because, you know, when you have a job like that, the company really tends to take care of you. And uh, um, after I did that, got out, worked for other companies um, in like Associated Press for their satellite and microwave relays. And, and then at one point I moved to California and uh, worked for Pacific Telesis out there as an engineer. So. It's just, you know, one thing after another. That's pretty much been my whole life. And then uh, about 17 years ago, I started my own company here in Denver uh, where we do uh, uh, IT engineering. Um, and uh, one of my big uh, contracts is Denver International Airport. Um, I do uh, a lot of the IT consulting out there, uh, work on a lot of their equipment, and uh, have several other uh, uh, companies that I work with and municipalities. The Denver Police Department I do some forensic analysis for. Um, and town alignment, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, I'm, I've always been a geek. My, both of my sons are geeks, and, and uh, that's just kind of what we do. <laughs> and uh, how old were you when you met Cammie, your wife? Uh, okay, so we got married in 2000, so I was 40. Hey. Um, yeah, so, yeah, 39, 38, 39, something like that, I think, when I met right. Cammie. Okay. Well, we'll be seeing her perhaps later if she pops in. So yes, in case well. someone doesn't know who we're talking about now, we've kind of given you a little <laughs> bit of info on her. Um, you have so much information that we can talk about. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about radar and satellites since you have specialties in those areas and the Denver airport. I mean, that's <laughs> since you work there now, everyone always talks about the murals. I've seen pictures of them. Have you seen them yourself? And what do you think? Absolutely. I have seen them myself. Um, they have changed over the years. Um, a lot of people were complaining about, you know, how incredibly dark they were. And so what they did is they had the artists come back in and actually make minor modifications to them. But Smiley faces and hearts on everything. <laughs> yeah, sort of. <laughs> but uh, it, it, I mean, they're still pretty dark. You still have that one Muriel with a with a Darth Vader looking guy there, um, you know, and his dagger out. Um, over the the dead children and it's just, just it's just weird why why does that exist i don't know and uh <laughs> they have other other really strange stuff too uh the you know the concourse between uh 
the main terminal and terminal A is called the uh, Great Hall, which is like a Masonic type term. Mm -hmm. um, and they have all kinds of weird art in there. And then down in baggage claim, they have uh, uh, the gargoyles um, all around baggage claim overlooking. So, so what's the strange. reason? Why is Denver the hot spot for this sort of thing? Why the Denver airports? What's what? What do people say is the reason? Well, what people say is the reason is because Denver and Atlanta are supposed to be the two main hubs for the New World Order, supposedly. Mm. Um, and it's interesting because there is actually a, uh, a dedication stone uh, in what is it? I think it's in uh, ticketing. Uh, and it says, uh, presented by the Masons for the New World Airport Commission. And, wow. <laughs> and there is no such thing as the New World Airport Commission. So you just got to wonder about that. So, but there's there's Masonic symbology all over the airport. It's just crazy. And then, of course, there's uh, other stories that uh, have been told about it. And I'm really not at liberty to talk about those things. But uh, suffice it to say, um, a lot of the rumors about it have some have some weight behind them. Hmm. People have told me that San Francisco is a very uh, Illuminati oriented city as well. You lived in California, but did you ever check out San Francisco from that aspect? Oh yeah. Uh, well, when I worked in California for Pacific Telesis, I did uh, all the microwave links uh, all over the state. So uh, I spent a lot of time in uh, San Francisco and, and uh, Los Angeles, all over the place. Mm -hmm. And San Francisco is interesting. It has all kinds of, uh, I guess, satanic uh, type of uh, architecture and, and Masonic architecture. And uh, a lot of people say that uh, when all of this comes down, when the New World Order actually uh, takes place that uh, one of the cities that will be destroyed will be San Francisco um, somehow and on into Sacramento and of course Sacramento has the name Sacramento as the sacrament or sacrifice sacrifice yeah yeah so that's just weird and if you look at all the little names of the hills and the landmarks and stuff it's bizarre so if anybody's never checked that out it's something to really look at it's very strange well, I lived in Modesto, California in 1986, I think. I worked at a radio station there in a, in a smaller city close by called Turlock, California. It's a horrible name, Turlock. It sounds like yes. toilet. <laughs> <laughs> but there is a city close by to there called Los Baños, which actually does mean the bathroom. So, yeah, I didn't live there, thank goodness. Yes. But uh, lived uh, in Modesto, worked in Turlock at a radio station, and uh, then later on moved to... Uh, uh, the Marin County area in Nevada and then worked while living there for a station in Napa Valley and then got tired of the commute and worked in Napa Valley at a station and then part-time worked in San Francisco uh, at KPIX TV at a time during the OJ Simpson trial when they did this little trial thing well during the trial weirdly enough they covered the whole OJ Simpson trial uh, they had an FM talk station that they brought in and FM talks not really ever made it usually talk radios on AM and you know we've got satellite funny enough satellite radio now and all these other things but back then of course we didn't have that sort of thing and uh, I worked for this uh, radio station in San Francisco on Battery Street and I would go into the city on the weekend to work there at this uh, FM talk station as they covered the OJ Simpson trial and um there would be live reporters there, you know, covering it and then different talking heads, I being one of them, uh, and different time slots talking about the trial. But the city itself, fascinating and beautiful. I really, really, really love uh, the, the look of California. Not northern as much, excuse me, not central California as much as northern California where San Francisco is. Just a gorgeous city. But like they say, heavily satanic. So yes. hopefully it won't be destroyed in some kind of an event. Yeah, I would hope not. And uh, I was actually based in Fresno. And, oh, well, I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fresno has been referred to as kind of the armpit of California. But yeah, uh, and it, I, I, I would wager that Turlock's way worse. <laughs> <laughs> well, way worse. Yeah, I, I, yeah, that's that's very possible. Um, but yeah, I had friends in Modesto and spent a lot of time up in Modesto. And uh, I guess a flat earth asshole is from Modesto. Yes. Too, right? yes. Yes, I need to message him. I've 
I've been a subscriber and I've shared his videos and commented on them and I definitely want to have him on. Uh, so yeah, he lives in Modesto and I even commented that I lived there at one point in life back in the 80s. So uh, yeah, he seems like an interesting, interesting YouTuber and would be a fun conversation to have. And hey, so. with a name like Flat Earth Asshole, it's going to be a good show. <laughs> <laughs> I like how his show or his videos are him taking his dog for a walk and just talking about life. Yeah, very you know, cool. The really weird thing about him, and this absolutely blew me away the first time that I saw him, uh, was his first video when he had the beard, right? Mm -hmm. I think he did his first two videos, he had the beard. And I looked at him and I went, oh my God, it was like seeing a ghost because he and my oldest son, Brandon, could absolutely be twins. I mean, they look so identical, it's scary. You go in and say, hey, Brandon are you are you actually flat earth asshole <laughs> come on you can tell me you can level with me i know yeah they even have the very similar mannerisms and everything and wow. i was thinking it's like you know i dated a lot of women back th at that no. time <laughs> <laughs> and uh so i was just going i wonder if i had a kid i didn't know about because that was just too weird next thing cue a call from flat earth asshole <laughs> dad <laughs> dad <laughs> So, yeah, and, you know, even in my younger days, um, uh, he and I had a very strong resemblance. Of course, I also had a beard back then as well. But, uh, I mean, I, and I'm going to actually show some pictures of my son, Brandon, you know, side by side with Jake. Um, because, the, like I said, they look like absolute doppelganger twins. It's just mind mind boggling. Well, let's so, go ahead and do that now if you've got them. Um, don't have them right here in front of me. I'd have All to right. pull them up on the computer, but oh, uh, yeah, I'd probably yeah. be doing them on the, on the Globuster show. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to steal the thunder of the Globuster show. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, yeah, you know, Modesto as well is a weird city in that there have been like some murders there and some weird goings on. Um, so uh, I can't even remember the news story, but this guy killed his wife, hit her mm -hmm. body. Do you remember that story? I do. So, and I know the motto of the city because I lived there for a while in the in the eighties, and it was this big arch, like a, I don't know, like a dome kind of, and it said water, wealth, contentment, health. And I think they should add murder <laughs> to they that murder. thing too. That's right. Yeah. I forgot about that. It's been a long time since I lived there, but uh, yeah, it was a big uh, big story. In fact, I think two different women disappeared there or something along those lines. Wasn't it Scott Peterson? Is that the name of the? Is that ringing a bell to you? That that name is the name of the. The murderer involved? I, I believe it was, yes. Yeah. Um, and there was a, uh, some other people named Scott Peterson. Uh, it's like, oh, what a horrible name to have after that yeah, guy. Yeah, exactly. Right? <laughs> Time to change your name. <laughs> Call me Scotty. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. All right, so uh, that's interesting about the Denver airport and all of that. Let's go back in time and talk about radar. I know that Mark Sargent on his Strange World show has had experts in radar, and I've spoke with Robin Poe on my show. And uh, the other day, somebody messaged me and said that one of Mark Sargent's guests, who is in the military and spoke about radar in a way proving the flat earth, was wrong. And that he had spoke to somebody who said that radar works. And, you know, I'm just repeating what somebody else said here. I don't know this myself, but you do. Uh, radar works with the, you need to have three things and triangulation and no way that would prove flat earth. Can you explain how radar works and can it be used in a way to prove flat earth? Um, yes, it can. And, and okay, so let me let me kind of go back to the basics on it. Uh, radar works by transmitting pulses of, of RF or radio frequency energy um, out from a feed horn in a uh, very directional um, direction. <laughs> <laughs> and so what happens is, is it works by the Doppler effect principle. And so when you transmit a pulse of uh, microwave energy essentially out of the feed horn, uh, it will go down range, however far, and it will hit a target, say an, an aircraft in this case. Um, the aircraft will return the RF pulse as an echo, okay, and it will come back and then it will be received. So what happens in the meantime is that when that radar uh, pulse is initially fired, um, there's also, it synchronizes with, with what's called a coherent oscillator, uh, or a coho, they call it. And the coherent oscillator basically will sit there and track so many cycles um, waiting for that pulse to return, okay? And w the way that that works is when the pulse comes back, you have a certain amount of time that will pass by, um, and then it can be calculated um, to the range of the target. And again, this is done by, you know, simple Doppler effect. 
um, what they do do is they will have the pulses sometimes staggered um, so that you don't get ghost images and stuff like that but all of this is just kind of a series uh, a complex series of, of uh, um, algorithms that are set up in the uh, radar itself now as far as as proving flat earth um, radar again like microwave um, is only supposed to work out as far as y you know it can before the earth is supposed to curve away however um, it never really occurred to us at the time but you know even even back when I was in the Air Force in 1978 we were working on these old old antiquated systems they were called like the FPN 47 and the MPN 13 which were like 1950s vintage we did have some newer stuff but I um, mean they were actually using stuff like that um, and even those radars uh, when you cranked up the power you could you could get a range out to you know 160 to 100 miles it was pretty fringe at that but you know some of the newer radars these days absolutely have easily that range and then some i think uh, there was a guy on mark's show that was talking about that as well that's who i'm talking about somebody challenged yeah. me and said that that guy was incorrect and he himself was in the military and he himself uses radar and said that guy didn't know what he was talking about oh, no, so i was, was wondering right. to me the guy although i don't have the experience you do the guy sounded dead on spot on so yeah absolutely well because theoretically you know the you know, when you get out past the horizon, it would be theoretically impossible for the pulse to come back. Um, now, the way that you would uh, actually try and track targets further downrange is you lower what's called the PRF or the pulse repetition frequency. And what that does is that allows more time for the pulse to come back before it fires off another pulse. So if you're painting targets that are very close to you, um, you can have a relatively quick PRF um, and you don't have to worry about you know a bunch of garbage downrange coming back and, and hitting you but if you're really looking for like approach radar long rate approach then you turn down the pulse repetition frequency which will then allow more time for the pulses to go out and come back and um, you know so that's basically how it works now you can only go so far in between you know those pulses um, and like I said theoretically you've got um, a finite range that you can actually go out to and that range is more uh, has more to do with the power that you're using to be able to get the pulse back because uh, radio frequencies tend to attenuate um, greatly as they go out and come back so the power is one thing the pulse repetition frequency is the other thing um, that that basically sets those parameters as far as you know as far as the distance that you want to cover out so uh, can it be used to uh, prove flat Earth? Absolutely, because when you go beyond the horizon, um, then you are, you know, theoretically supposedly going over the curvature of the Earth, and that would be impossible, especially at microwave frequencies. So, yes. So the expert, I believe his name was Brian, if I'm not mistaken, maybe I've got that wrong, who was on Mark Sargent's Strange World show talking about radar and flat Earth, in your opinion, was talking with legitimate knowledge absolutely he was yes all right good to know good to know that's kind of what i was trying to say too but uh too bad i didn't have you right there to jump in and explain all that <laughs> all right now that's stuff you did in the past and currently i mean in more recent times satellites have been a part of your life uh did it ever occur to you that satellites weren't real at all ever did it ever make you scratch your head on how does this really work pre-flat earth knowledge uh, nope, it never did. Uh, in fact, it made perfect sense to me at the time because um, we were dealing with uh, delays, uh, which would make sense because, you know, we were told that those satellites were 23,000 miles out in space, you know, some of the comm satellites. And so uh, one of the divisions of Western Telecommunications um, was called the Sat Phone. Um, and I would actually go out to oil fields where they're drilling for oil and they, you know, since they were in the middle of nowhere they needed uh, communication so I would go out there dragging a trailer behind with a dish and I would set up the the trailer and point it at a satellite and um, how did you know where the satellite was supposed to be did you have a chart or something yeah we would have specific uh, azimuth and elevation coordinates that we would point it mm -hmm. at um, or that I would point it at because typically I just did it by myself it wasn't that hard um, and then I would run in the cabling um, and put it into the demultiplexer and, and uh, hook it up to a telephone and bada bing, they had telephone service. And of course, when you got on it, there was this, you know, rather substantial delay. And, 
the explanation for that was well because it's going 23,000 miles out and 23,000 miles back 56,000 miles and if you calculate that against the speed of light um, then the delay would seem to be right um, so everything about it um, seemed to make perfect sense um, the fact that we are pointing up at a specific target um, that seemed to be you know stationary geostationary not going anywhere um, you just never think about it you know you just think that it's absolutely real and so as soon as I got into flat earth that was my biggest objection it's like well yes. you know, there's no way that this could possibly happen um, and then I really started thinking about it and have since you know come up with several reasons and several methodologies um, that could possibly um, emulate satellites and, I, uh, I definitely want to hear about them satellites and the meteors slash comets those are the things that have puzzled me the most in the flat earth world there's many theories but the satellites i know you'd be the one to to give us a breakdown about what you think okay well what i think is is uh i think there are a few ways that it can be done um when i was um looking at uh, uh the guy that uh, jumped uh from you know that set the high altitude record mm, so yes felix name. baumgartner yeah, felix and baumgartner. red bull jump Right. So I watched that um, video several times and I noticed that when he jumped out that there was hardly any um, agitation on his clothes. You could hardly see any wind blowing or anything like that. And it, it wasn't until he got literally below 100,000 feet that you could start seeing the effects mm -hmm. um, on his clothing for atmosphere. Yeah. So it occurred to me that, you know, it must be really, really still up there. Um, there's got to be an atmosphere, obviously, to some degree because they're able to take uh, the balloons up that high. So I think that one way that it could absolutely be done is to have um, a stationary type of balloon up there uh, where you could keep it in place uh, with electric motors. You could have uh, um, uh, solar panels providing the electricity to do that. And if there's not a whole lot of wind up there, it wouldn't require a whole lot of correction um, very often. So you could indefinitely, you could theoretically keep something up there indefinitely. Um, How would the balloon not pop? Because when we see these balloons go up 20 miles, and I mean, they, they eventually pop. Well, they eventually pop, but I mean, obviously, if you have different materials um, that is going to be much more resilient. Um, ah, and, and materials that aren't pop. something you and I can get our hands on. Right, well, and, and yet, yet we can. I mean, I know that uh, people can buy some of the military-grade uh, balloons, you know, that, that they use for weather balloons, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm sure that uh, there's some sort of... of uh, you Black know, market balloon. <laughs> yeah, made of unobtainium. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, yeah, so that would be the most likely thing. And initially I was thinking, you know, if there was a firmament up there, then the most logical way, at least at the time I was thinking, uh, to get the satellite up there would be to simply bounce it off of, you know, the glass firmament or the electromagnetic firmament, whatever it is. And then it occurred to me after I had worked all this out and, you know, tried to do the geometry on it, it occurred to me, it's like, wait a minute, Bob, <laughs> satellites have different transponder frequencies. In other words, there's an uplink frequency and then there's a downlink frequency. And you can't just bounce a, you know, one signal and have it change frequencies up there. Something has got to transpose that frequency. So that would tell me that there has to be some sort of physical device up there that is actually, you know, repeating um, the signal from the ground. Um, now, that's not to say that they couldn't be sending up a signal uh, and not using a transponder, but in my experience with all the work that I did, there was always a transponder. There was always an uplink and a downlink. Um, it, it would theoretically be possible, I suppose, to just send up a signal at uh, 6.1 gigahertz or whatever and have it come back down uh, if you knew the geometry of the firmament. But um, it just seems to me like it's, it's much more likely that they actually have some sort of vehicle up there. And even if, you know, even if it is not something like that and we do have a firmament that is... Um, solid okay glass you know like the bible would describe um what's to say that that something could not be physically attached to mm -hmm. you know that up there um the military is never going to tell us anything like that suction so, cups i mean that'll work something like that you know who <laughs> yeah. knows um uh so i mean that those are a couple of possibilities that i thought of and uh, but again, I think that, uh, you know, some sort of high altitude craft is, is the most likely. And of course, you know, people say, well, how can it, you know, stay up there a lot? And well, the dirigible could stay up there by, you know, if it has a solid enough material. And also, 
you know, if you have aircraft up there, um, the aircraft can stay up virtually indefinitely because they can be refueled in flight. Um, of course, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that uh, it would be um, a wise choice to use aircraft as a satellite, you know, emulation, uh, mm -hmm. because it's something that's going to need to be up there pretty much all the time, continuously. Right. Satellite so, down, plane had to land. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and of course, yeah. they do have, you know, backup redundancies where they will switch to other transponders and stuff like that. And that does happen periodically, you know, for whatever reason. Usually when they do that, it's because of some atmospheric variable. I remember uh, being in radio, and this was in the 90s. The engineer would have to go adjust something involving the satellite feed that we would receive. Different transponders, different channels because of sunspots that's what he would say what do you think about all that now with the whole sunspots thing and the satellites well you know the, the sunspots... i mean i remember the engineer going to do it and then we, the, the the feed we were getting for the radio station of abc news or whatever it was that would come in at the top of the hour and at the bottom of the hour would would be very like spotty it would be like not really perfectly you know sounding so there was something happening what was it Right. Well, you know, solar activity, as you know, there are solar flares and because the sun is um, full spectrum, I mean, it's not only full spectrum light, but it also throws out a quite an RF spectrum uh, of interference as well. So if the sun is in, is very active, um, there could be um, some interference with, you know, certain transponder frequencies, um, you know, due to, you know, well, various conditions, a lot of different things can cause it. So, of course, as flat earthers, we believe that the sun is not 93 million miles away. So it would stand to reason that if it's really only 3,000 miles up there, that it would have a considerably more profound effect um, on any type of communications. Um, you know, they have like the Carrington event uh, that happened back in, the, I think, the late 1800s, where it, it literally burned up telegraph lines um, from the electromagnetic pulse that was put out from the sun. Um, so the only thing that, that I find interesting about that now is when you look at the solar flares and, and look at the solar spots, it doesn't, the stuff that you get from NASA does not really look like what you see from amateur um, uh, astronomers that are actually, mm -hmm. um, the, and, and not only that, when a solar event happens like a flare, um, they will predict that, oh, well, it'll hit the Earth in anywhere from 24 to 72 hours, or if it's ejected at an extremely high rate of speed, um, you know, it can hit it, you know, considerably sooner than that. Um, so that obviously has to be completely fabricated. And that's kind of the, the frame of mind that you have to be in when you are, are looking at things in terms of flat Earth. Because we've all, you know, argued with the people that will try and use ball earth physics with the sun 93 million miles away uh, with the with the model that they have the magnetics that they have all that and you know as i've said before you've got to think outside the box this requires an entirely new way of thinking um, a lot of times um, to be able to reconcile some of the things that are happening and some of the things that we're seeing and it's not impossible to reconcile either there's there's actually a lot of good explanations um for stuff and you know this magnetic model that i always you know harp about um explains a lot including the stars and you know the southern pole and anom pole star anomalies and stuff like that and that's a model that we're working on now so and i want to talk with you about that in a minute but i was thinking about a youtuber that maybe at one time you were a fan of i know i was i've unsubscribed i still think the guy's probably a wonderful person but it just doesn't fit in with what i've learned and that would be a youtuber named suspicious observers who yes. would do a lot of uh, things with sunspots. Are your feelings about that particular person similar to mine? Yes. Uh, in fact, Ben, um, Ben is his name, Ben Davidson. Mm -hmm. well, um, nice guy. I mean. He's a great guy. Um, yeah. And he, he is heavily involved in the Thunderbolts project uh, with Wal Thornhill and, and uh, Dave Talbot. Um, and, you know, one of these days I would actually like to attend one of those conferences because even though their electric universe model is based on, you know, the standard heliocentric model, um, there is a whole lot of merit to it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, they also are big prop proponents of everything, you know, gravitational effects not being necessarily gravity, but more electrical effects, um, electromagnetic type effects and, and stuff like that. So um, I actually, 
still listen to Ben and listen to his, uh, you know, updates. Not not all as much as I used to, but uh, I still listen to him because um, it's very interesting to listen to his analysis um, of what's going on with the sun and also some of the other people that are on as well. And what I think is really funny is that uh, a lot of the guys that he works with, as well as Ben himself, um, are rather puzzled because to them it appears like the earth is causing much more uh, having much more effect on the sun than it absolutely should uh, <laughs> and of course that's gee i wonder well, why yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know it would be interesting to talk with him about flat earth do you think anybody has i mean he's a youtuber he can't have missed the flat earth stuff no i i, th I think that he would consider it but not publicly because mm -hmm. he's got you know a couple hundred thousand followers and let's face but are it, followers you know, that important. I mean, yes, I guess maybe it's his, maybe it's his income or something. But yet, you could bring those followers along with you on a new journey that's part of the journey you're already on, if you're brave enough. I, that's well, that's the key right there. Because I mean, we've all experienced the ridicule, right? I mean, mm, yeah. Um, every day. <laughs> yes, every single day. You know, they tell us how crazy we are, and and you know, always are going back to the standard physics, and 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 nobody really wants to be subject to that. You know, that's why I laugh at people that say, oh, yeah, these these gatekeeper guys, the really big names in Flat Earth are doing it for the money. It's like, oh, my God. <laughs> I had somebody comment on one of my uh, videos or it was a video I made a comment on. Yeah, it was a video I made a comment on someone else's video, a person I'd never heard of before. And their comment was, you're pushing a lie, Patty, calling me Patty to diminish me. I don't call myself Patty. And uh, you're promoting a lie, Patty. I hope you age horribly. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. Well, I'm already 53, so. Yeah. <laughs> but the thing is, is why would somebody say that? Uh, just a really, you know, low blow sort of strange comment because they're actually afraid of the truth. It's got to be that they're afraid of the truth. Yeah, I, I think so. Or, or afraid of the truth or they don't want to be humiliated or they just want to be part of the crowd that's right and not the mm -hmm. you know the dumbasses that are looking at flat earth and actually I'm proud to be a dumbass <laughs> yeah me too you know yeah. and, and if you know and i think go by what they the, say. a lot of the flat earthers are super intelligent too oh you yes know? Mm -hmm. i mean yes granted there are you know some people that that aren't necessarily but that doesn't mean that that you know just because they can't work out all the engineering and stuff like that doesn't mean that they can't look and see you know, with their own eyes and understand it. Um, and in, in, a, in a lot of ways, those people are f way further awake than, you know, some of the top scholars, you know. Yeah, it's, a, it's about what we can see with our own eyes, really. And then if you have that background like you do and you're able to uh, really dig deep, that's all the better. But anybody, even with, you know, a high school dropouts can, uh, can grasp flat earth if they're willing to set aside their preconceived notions and open their heart and their mind. That's the key there. And some people seem instantly willing and other people just absolutely no way. So, yeah, I think a lot of, of, you know, people that are the high school dropouts, as you put it, or, you know, never bothered to go to college. Um, mostly it was because they always saw something wrong kind of with mm -hmm. the world. I mean, or I they were I bored with way. school. They were interested in other things they were doing. Very I always much so. I always saw uh, that there was something wrong with the world too. And I understood that it's all, it's fake and make believe and the wrong sorts of things are, are what seems to be admired. And I didn't want to try to go achieve in that world. Um, so I just thought, this is dumb. What am I doing? And then I started working in radio. Right. But uh, yeah, who, I who agree. Who wants to go $100,000 into debt either, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, had it not been for uh, my, my GI Bill, um, I certainly would not have taken any classes. Um, or any college courses or anything like that. Um, but I was one of those fortunate people that, that had the GI Bill, you know, back in the day when they actually appreciated veterans, um, where they would pay 90% of all of your tuition and material, and all you had was 10% left. And uh, that's where I actually got a lot of my flight training paid for, it was with that. What do so, they pay now? I, they give you a pencil, pat yeah, on the back. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea. They give you discounts, you know, that aren't even really discounts. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I when I was financing this house, I, I said, oh, good, I'm a veteran. I get to qualify for a VA loan. It's like, you're better off with, a, you know, just a standard loan. Um, so the, you, they really don't give the veterans much of anything. Um, in fact, I think it seems to go down uh, every year. 
uh, you know, seemingly to me. So I honestly don't know what their educational benefits are at this time. I do know that, that they want you to spend a minimum of six years, uh, I'd do a six year stint to get uh, any type of decent educational benefits, but they're not 100% paid by any means. So, Are either of your sons um, on a military track eventually, do you think? No. Because of their dad? No. Uh, my son, uh, Brandon, uh, actually works for Microsoft. He is a, mm. uh, a security analyst for Microsoft. And uh, of course, Jaron um, is only 12 years old. So, right. <laughs> uh, but, but he is, he's quite, he, he's amazing uh, in his abilities. You know, he maintains uh, all of uh, Jaron Campanella's um, chat rooms and, and the blogs and all that stuff. He I is didn't know the, that he did that for some reason. Wow, interesting. Uh, yeah, he does all that well. stuff. Yeah, 12, he does all that and does all the customizations. He's been working on a guy uh, building a whole new um, type of chat room and, and blog. And it's really cool what they're doing to it. It's going to be very unique. And uh, in the Jaronism chat, we use uh, a software called Boom Chat. And uh, my son, Jaron, has been working with Robert, who is the creator of Boom Chat. Um, he worked with him to create the very latest versions of Boom Chat. And uh, he's always making code modifications, stuff like that. He's fluent in in uh, C++, um, JavaScript. I mean, there's so many different languages. I don't even, I can't even keep track of them all. And the amazing thing is he's taught himself all of them. Um, I have not taught them any of, uh, any of those languages. I don't know half of those languages. So, um, you know, I do, I do Microsoft and Novell and, and Cisco and stuff like that myself. Impressive young men and men, both of your sons, I'm sure. But that would make sense, actually, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they didn't fall yeah. too far from the tree. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, all right. I want to find out about the model that you were speaking of earlier. And, you know, these days it's a uh, um, model geddon like Armageddon with everybody fighting uh, the people that are involved with models tooth and nail against other people. My model's right. Your model's stupid. You're a shill because you believe in that model, et cetera, et cetera. Models have been a bone of contention in the flat earth world. I don't really have a model. I know it's flat and we're not moving. But other than that, I'm open to all of the interesting ideas. What have you got, Bob? Well, our model, and, and I work on this model with my wife, Cammie. Um, uh, it's so great, by the way, to have a partner. You guys are so lucky. And just like Jaron and Missa and several others in Flat Earth, to have somebody who you spend your life with who is helping you and you're helping them and you're doing this together. What a what a blessing. Yeah, it, it really is cool. And Cammie has gotten into uh, Flat Earth um, you know, she was a little apprehensive initially, um, and then she hey, kind of you have to be. Yep. <laughs> it's kind of a crazy world. <laughs> yep. But uh, now she's very much into it, and uh, so we, you know, we try and figure out all the puzzles. And honestly, um, I listen to people's criticism. Um, one of the things that uh, um, really struck me hard um, was, you know, when you look at this map behind me, the the uh, uh, Gleason's map. Mm -hmm. um, the argument that came out that I simply could not ignore was, well, if you have uh, the, the southern tip of South America pointing south in one direction and Africa southern tip pointing south in another direction, and then Australia, of course, on the other side looking south is another direction, how do you reconcile the southern stars? And, you know, to me, initially I was thinking, man, that's kind of a flat earth killer. But... Um, a lot of people have kind of come back and said, well, the map is wrong. And to some degree, I, I tend to think that, that it is. I mean, but uh, as I was saying earlier, when you try and solve these conundrums, you can't just, you know, throw up your hands and say, OK, I give up and ignore all the other evidence for Flat Earth um, that, that is out there. So what I try to do is I try and adapt what I know to a model that is viable, um, not only in, you know, the lab, um, but, you know, can actually be applied to what we're seeing visually. And mm -hmm. what we're working on now, and this is something that, you know, as I said, it's a work in progress, is I started um, looking at the magnetic models. And, and one of the very interesting things that you look at when you first start finding out about um, uh, geomagnetics is, first of all, that, that magnetic south is actually at the North Pole 
and magnetic north is actually at the south pole. But beyond that, it gets even stranger because you find out that magnetic north pole and magnetic south pole are nowhere near the poles. Of course, we know we know that everybody knows that, but I don't think people really realize, um, you know, how far they really are off. For example, magnetic south um, is, I think, at 65 degrees south, 66 degrees south, which, you know, that leaves you a whole nother 33 degrees down there that, you know, before Coincidentally, the, 33 degrees. Yeah, yeah, and I may be <laughs> a little bit off on that, and and God, don't let anybody, you know, crucify me for saying 33, but, um, and it may not exactly be that, but the point is, is that where the magnetic south pole is, um, is actually just a little bit north of Antarctica. So you start looking at that, and you think, wow, that doesn't make, that's crazy, that doesn't make a lot of sense, um, and the further implications of that are that navigation would be greatly skewed as well as our maps would be greatly skewed. Um, so what I'm working on uh, with the magnetic model is I'm going under the assumption that, well, first I'm looking at where the true north and south poles are, and they are moving around a little bit, but I'm looking at magnetic fields, okay? And, of course, everybody has looked at magnetic fields in terms of you know, you take a bar magnet and you, you put a piece of paper over it and you sprinkle a little bit of iron ore on it and you see these magnetic flux lines, okay? Um, well, those magnetic flux lines are three-dimensional. They are in a toroidal shape, okay? So they are literally expanding all around us. And so when, when we look at the stars and talk in terms of star fields, the star fields are in fact, and this I believe this 100%, are in fact just an extension of the primary magnetic fields of the plane itself. So, and the other thing that you need to understand about, mag about magnetic fields is even if you have a, a standard neodymium magnet or any type of magnet, um, you know, just because those magnetic fields or the iron ore filings are not moving around on a piece of paper, that does not mean that the fields are not moving. The fields absolutely are moving. Um, they, they, each band has its own frequency, both on the centrifugal ring and the centripetal ring. Um, and those frequencies don't necessarily correspond to what we think of as, as like audio frequencies, which would be like uh, 30 to, to 30,000 hertz uh, uh, on up into the light or x-ray frequencies. But these go um, into frequencies where it's like maybe uh, 100 years per cycle or 1,000 years per cycle. Um, it has a full range of frequencies that you can actually, uh, that are demonstrable. They're absolutely there. So when I look at the star fields, um, I'm thinking that, you know, one of these fields in the magnetic model um, is a 24-hour field that is literally taking the stars and moving it around the plane. And this would actually also solve a lot of the anomalies that we're looking at as, as to how come... Um, you know, we can see these, these stars rotating around the northern hemisphere uh, as well as, as we can see them doing the same thing around Sigma Octanus. Well, that wouldn't make a whole lot of sense if you're trying to, to identify this in terms of the flat Earth map. But when you look at it in the magnetic model, suddenly it makes perfect sense. And beyond that, when you're looking at it, um, uh, you know, when they, they will show the camera shots from the equator and you'll see the stars kind of diverging apart in two different directions. Well, that is exactly what happens at the midpoint of like any bar magnet, okay? You, when you look at those fields, those iron ore fields, you see this, you see this um, toroidal magnetic pattern and it does have a center point and that center point is where we're looking at it on the flat earth, okay? And so thus you have this divergent field. So what I'm doing is I'm taking all of those factors into consideration and coming up with something entirely new. Now the other thing that a lot of people don't realize about magnetic fields is that since you know magnetic fields are, is the same as essentially light, light is an electromagnetic wave and it is affected profoundly by static magnetic fields. Um, in fact, there's a ton of uh, demonstrations that you can see out there in YouTube um, where people have taken magnetic fields and literally place them in strategic positions so that it will bend light around objects, okay? So it looks like you're, you're looking right through something, 
Um, but all it's doing is the, the field of, of light or the field of vision is literally being manipulated magnetically. So if we, and this is called the Faraday effect, by the way, and you, uh, you may have heard me talk about this. Mm -hmm. um, and the Faraday effect, anybody can look this up. Um, it's basically when you have a high intensity flux field um, and light crosses it, it will deflect that light. Um, it, it, not necessarily in a refractive type of property, um, but but it, I guess it is a refractive type of pro a property, but not done through atmosphere itself, but done through a magnetic field. These are demonstrable, provable models. And if if the entire universe is electric and electricity and magnetism are one and the same, then it only makes sense to build this model based on uh, electromagnetic forces. Do you think that we've been lied to on purpose about where the poles are? And how far back is that data, do you think, when that lie began? Um, I, I think maybe to some degree, but um, again... People to, could have just been wrong, or was it purposely lying to, to throw us off the truth? I think at some point, you know, and I still, I still wonder about, you know, when they talk about uh, geomagnetic flips, um, pole flips. Yes, I remember the whole uh, Earth crust displacement and polar shift that was supposed to happen. I guess that was sometime in the 80s. A lot of warnings about that happening. Right. And, you know, the sun supposedly does that, you know, every 11 years, it, it has this magnetic flip. However, you know, one hasn't happened in, you know, several hundred thousand years on Earth. So again, that's one of those things that they say, well, the evidence for it is you can tell by the way that the the rocks are magnetized, you know, near the poles. And there's evidence that that there's been a magnetic pole shift. Well, that may or may not be true. The fact is, is that we have never seen that happen in our lifetimes or in recorded history. Um, this is one of those things that's uh, another scientific speculation, kind of like dinosaurs, right? Mm. But at least they have bones for dinosaurs, but, you know, they could be very well something else. But that's a whole other topic. Altogether. I wanted to ask you about dinosaurs earlier because uh, <laughs> we'll get to that. But it was because when you mentioned your son, Jaron, and now he's 12, and, you know, I was wondering what he was into. And I know he's past the age for dinosaurs, but I wanted to ask you about was he ever into dinosaurs? And have you ever talked to him about other possibilities when it came to that when he was younger? Um, and he's never really been into dinosaurs. However, um, he, you know, he does listen to a lot of the things that I say and study and stuff. And my take on dinosaurs is if they were real, if they were real, they sure as heck were not 63 million years ago or, you know, millions and millions of years ago. I don't believe that for one second. Um, there's been a large amount of evidence that what they are calling dinosaur bones um, are actually just, you know, other creatures, um, and they've misidentified them. And in fact, there seems to be quite a concerted effort to, um, you know, hide that knowledge. Um, I think, you know, Jaron and I were talking about one guy that offered um, to have some dinosaurs checked, you know, actually to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And of course, they wouldn't do it. You know, I heard that phone call. There's a YouTube video about that. Guys yeah. calling and saying, We're, yeah. "We'll offer you this money if you just take this bone and you know and study it and do a carbon dating on it." And the person's like, "No, we can't. We won't." Exactly. So, and you you have to wonder why. You know, right? Um, because you know, I think that a lot of people are are on the inside are understanding that that it's a big hoax. I mean, I don't believe. You know, like I said, if they existed, it wasn't that long ago, but uh, I would tend to think that, you know, they don't really exist at all. So, um, never <laughs> did. And Someone's way, being pushed is, into the camera, you know, like the stage you, mom. Kneel down a little bit, Jaren. So, okay, this is hey, my son, Jaren. Jaren. <laughs> my name is Patricia. Hello. How are you? <laughs> and this is Hello, Cammie. Hello, Cammie. How are you? <laughs> say, say, I'm doing fine. <laughs> Hey, Jaron, I hear you are uh, just a, a brainiac and help Jaron Campanella and your dad out with so much stuff that, wow, I wish I knew somebody like you who could help me out with that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, he, he does. He helps out everybody and, and uh, he's just amazing. And it's all self-taught. He taught it all, all to himself. Wow. Well, you guys are doing well as parents. Yes. Really well. Thank you. You know... This is the kind of parents that we need Thanks, buddy. on the flat earth, really. People who are teaching their children truths, and at least if they're not quite sure of what to teach their children, they're keeping their ch child open-minded. 
How do you fight the whole school system trying to indoctrinate him? Well, we don't fight this. We don't fight the school system. We simply um, tell Jaron what he's going to be taught. Um, and, and, and it's funny because, you know, we told him this last year about, you know, how the whole flat earth thing would come up. Mm-hmm. And it was amazing. The very first thing that they, you know, went into was how silly the whole notion of flat earth was. And they keep pressing it. I mean, almost daily. In fact, uh, Cammy was in a, a meeting with one of the uh, faculty, right? And Jaron had gotten in a little bit of trouble because, you know, he hacked the entire school system computer. <laughs> but anyway, that's another story. Um. <laughs> he sounds like a, a young man who a movie would be made about, you know? <laughs> and he'd be the star of the movie. Yeah, he's, uh, well, I'll tell you, it's um, never a dull moment with him around. Let's put it that way. Yeah. But uh, anyway, so he cammy was in a meeting with one of the faculty there and uh he was talking about something that jaron had done that was really silly and he goes oh geez it's almost as stupid as you know if the earth was flat or something like that or some comment like that and cammy <sighs> was just taken aback like uh <laughs> you know how do you respond to that but i mean it, it is it's so it's so brought to the forefront in people's mm-hmm. consciousness and the reason the reason that's happening of course is because they've got to you know generate a counter propaganda Mm -hmm. um you know for the people that are waking up and and reinforce the idea that anybody that even wants to look at this and uh believe in it is just a complete moron and that's that's the key word moron that's the number one word used is moron um to to fight against flat earth awakening and yeah every day you look at something of course we have obama saying in two different speeches that he didn't have time for the flat earth society somebody wrote that speech Mm -hmm. wasn't off the cuff put that in there on purpose maybe even obama at the time didn't even know why he was saying it just another speech it's always there in the news there's all sorts of articles daily that have that in there as a joke and innocent people who are in the matrix as we all once were read that and it they get programmed oh, flat earth is a joke, flat earth is stupid. And even things such as Tila Tequila coming out, kind of, although, you know, maybe she is a person who's awakened to flat earth. She certainly talked the talk on her Twitter, among other things. But it it serves the purpose in a way to make flat earth appear dumb because you've got a woman that many could call a bimbo or, you know, she's been in porn. So it's like uh, they're releasing flat earth. I think they were somehow releasing flat earth information while attempting at the same time to to keep it down. Oh, I think yeah. there's they're trying different methods to just make everybody go back to sleep. Oh, sure. The best way to control the opposition is to lead it, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's what they say. Um, and when you get celebrities out there like B.O.B. and Tila Tequila and, you know, tweeting this stuff. And I would imagine that uh, because of of their position in the music world and acting world, um, you know, they're considered actors or, or, you know, songwriters, artists, something like that, not scholars by any means. And uh, therefore, when they come out and they have Neil deGrasse Tyson, you know, do rap battles with them and stuff like that people think that there's actually some some something valid about that you know to invalidate the whole flat earth theory so i don't know if if the whole bob thing was part of of you know trying to control the movement or not by ridicule Mm -hmm. or tequila tequila it certainly has worked out that way to a large degree Mm -hmm. um but um you know we need to keep you know we need to get people that are in a position to show the scientific side and engineering side to it, um, that would be a great help to us. I mean, I nominate you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. But uh, we and, need a whole lot me, more yous out there, and we have them actually. Yes, we do. Yes, and I'm you know I'm hopeful that you know if I can come up with something that is based you know soundly and yes you know I have my credentials as an electrical engineer, um, and I can come up with something that is viable. Um, that is demonstrable, then suddenly maybe we can start getting some of the other scientific and engineering community to to start looking at it, you know, with a little bit more of an open mind and saying, you know, all they need to do is look. That's what I, I just think. Just look, just look. But so many people won't look because the letters behind their name make sure that they won't look. They don't want to lose their job. They That's don't right. want to lose their, you know, the money that they're receiving, um, grants and such. And right. Yeah. And also they don't want to be called stupid. 
great. Ostracized. Yeah. But but the good part is 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 you know we have our people like like the Brian Mullins of the world. Yeah, I was going to say, and Brian, we don't hear from him that much anymore. And uh, he changed his channel from when I interviewed him on Flat Earth and Other Hot Potatoes from Balls Out Physics to just Brian Mullen. And his last video, I think it's called Force the Line, when he was talking about doing a form of a rectilinear experiment. Yes. And I don't know what happened with that, but I do know the Stephen Christ uh, rectilinear didn't work out for him. No. Um, but, and it but, was great that he went actually on his YouTube channel and admitted it didn't go right. Yeah, so. I got to give him kudos for that. I Me mean, too. He still believes in his model, and that's great. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I really thought, wow, that's amazing that he came out and he goes, hey, uh, Cyrus Teed lied. You know, this right. is not possible to do this. There's no way that it could have happened. Um, and he goes, I appreciate everybody following me. He goes, I still believe in the model. But uh, the fact is, the rectilinear exper rectilineator experiment was a fraud. And uh, I just thought, wow, that took a lot of guts to say Certainly that. Certainly did. And many people were theorizing when he started gearing up for the rectilineator. And it, he had videos out with him and his uh, crew building it. And they were very pumped up. And it was kind of exciting in a way, even if that's not something I believe in. But, you know, I felt really... Uh, a connection to them because they were connected themselves working as a team and sometimes in flat earth we have different camps that aren't working together as a team and are more fighting each other and I thought hey those guys small group but they're they're very tightly knit and whatever they do they're going to stick together and I admired them for that and people were saying that you know even if the rectilineator experiment fails he's going to lie and he's going to say it worked and the earth is concave but no, he was honest. Didn't need to be. He could have faked it. How would we know? How would we know? He mm -hmm. was honest. And I've also noticed that he and his uh, followers have slowed down in uh, chat on the various YouTube videos, uh, you know, arguing with people uh, and with their, you know, the Earth's concave and, and that sort of thing. So right. they've stepped back and maybe taken a more serious look at things. Yeah. So. Well, they got a little wind, wind taken out of their sails, I think, you know. Yeah. Um, but, you know, when I was looking at at all the models, and I still you look at looked all the at models. concave for a while. I remember I that period did. of time, and I admired you for doing that. I thought it was great. Yeah, and and to be honest with you, some of the things that Stephen had in some of his models um, were spot on. Um, mm -hmm. You know, his entire model of how the um, the moon eclipses could work uh, and passing through the very electromagnetic fields that I've been talking about, um, he had that. He already had that, you know, and I saw that and I went, wow, that's outstanding. How can we apply this to the flat earth model? Um, and now, you know, I'm pretty much trying to do that with the entire electromagnetic field because I still, I, I, ultimately I came to my conclusions that concave was not the reality. I don't believe it. I'm still open to the possibility um, because there are a lot of things going on visually um, that that are fooling our eyes, okay? Um, I don't think that that seeing the horizon, you know, rise to our eyes is fooling our eyes. However, um, I think that some of the explanations for the sun and its position and how it can be seen coming from the east and setting in the west, like on the solstices, um, on all different latitudes. I mean, that was that's that was another conundrum I looked at and I couldn't figure out. And I thought Mr. Thrive and Survive Rich had a great uh, idea on on how to solve that and of course his solution was when you look through this glass it essentially gives the same appearance that the sun is at multiple different places at one and so the idea behind that was well okay so it must be the firmament or this crystalline structure in the firmament that is giving us that effect and I still think that's a very viable explanation however um, I think that um, because of the the strong electromagnetic fields that have to be in place and are in place around our little plane here, um, that that explanation I think is going to ultimately you know, come to fruition a lot better than, than maybe riches, or maybe it's going to be a combination of both. But what I want to be able to do is actually, you know, start modeling this. So, you know, I've ordered a whole bunch of neodymium magnets and, and lasers. In fact, the laser that Jaron had is, is nothing compared to the one I have now. <laughs> mm. <laughs> one I have now is a barn burner. It's huge. Um, so, and we, we will be, yeah, we will be doing some experiments with that. So but, when uh, we uh, hear in the mainstream news, strange fire happened in Denver. <laughs> no one can explain why. We'll be like, oh, yeah, must be Bob. Oh, yeah, I know. It was great. You know, the first time I got this new laser, it's a it's a three watt laser. Uh, I was playing with it up in my office here and I was setting a piece of paper 
um, 10, 12 feet away on fire, you know, from 10 or 12 feet away. Boys and their toys. <laughs> oh, I know. Yeah, yeah. And I could solder with it 10 feet away. Like, I really need to do that. But, you know, just fun stuff like that. But, uh, but I have yeah. a little tiny laser I just bought. I have it here, <laughs> which is this one right here. Um, ah, okay. For uh, uses this little battery here for, you know, just a little moonlight test for my own amusement. Yeah, and then I can play with my cats with it later. <laughs> Yeah, oh, they'll love that. That's the one that's that's just the thermometer, right? The laser thermometer. Yes, exactly. Laser thermometer. Excuse yeah. me. Yes. I need to get so. one of those. Yeah, uh, Amazon. I bought it through uh, through Jaren's uh, link on his Amazon. So, yep. to uh, you know what I'm talking about, of course. Yep. There's two things you have that I want to get eventually, and that's your night vision goggles and oh, yeah. one of those. And I have my P900 back here. Oh yeah. Um, that, uh, you know, I, all of us I, flat earthers are, you know, wanting these same little toys oh, <laughs> for the totally. same reason. It's funny because explore your world, you know. Yep, this is like the P nine hundred has become the kind of the unofficial camera of all the flat earthers. It, you know? it certainly is, and they're probably wondering <laughs> why do we see an uptick, you know, on uh, sales around this time? Hmm, and they're probably writing it off to to something that they don't even know why. But uh, they could even market it to flat earthers. Well, probably not. But uh, funny, yeah. funny enough. You know, I used to spend my time and money on, you know, buying other things and doing other things. I'd buy clothing. I owned a clothing store. I mean, I was into that. I still have all the clothes, but I don't really shop anymore for clothes. I don't really I'll still wear what I've got, but I, I don't. I'd rather buy a, you know, laser thermometer <laughs> with my money. <laughs> to me, that's the new thrill or, you know, so. Yep. Things we can test with for sure. Yeah, things have changed for all of us in Flat Earth. And it really is a wonderful and refreshing thing. It's it's not a hobby. It's a it's a way, a new way of thinking. It's a way of life. And I'm really uh, happy that I was able to discover it. And there's many Flat Earthers who are really young that are in it. And then there's people around our age. Uh, and it's for everybody. doesn't matter. Just Absolutely. open your eyes. Absolutely yeah. it is. And it's, it's fun. I like it. And, and you know, I've always been the, the, the kind of guy that uh, liked the oddball stuff, you know, the stuff mm -hmm. that wasn't so mainstream. Um, yeah, I, I mean, because... you said you like Richard C. Hoagland. I was liking <laughs> Richard C. Hoagland, too, at one point. Yep. Um, you know. Yeah. yeah, I thought the whole, you know, the whole Sedonia face on Mars. And, of course. Oh, I, yes. I, <laughs> I, I see it. Yeah, I mean, I see it for what it is now. But, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, and what it is, you know, but at the time, I thought, Oh, geez, I bought into it for exactly the reasons that they wanted me to buy into it. Yes, and, you did. That it, trap was set for you. And I don't think yes. Richard C. Hoagland is actually a bad guy. I don't think he's trying to fool people. What's your take on him? Well, I have Does met he know? Richard C. Um, twice. And oh. I have spent some time with Richard C. Mm -hmm. Hoagland um, at the Secrets Conference uh, back in 2009 and 2010 I did both of them uh, they were three-day events um, of course I was kind of buddy buddy with David Wilcock uh, also and William Henry is a good friend of mine also mm -hmm. and so we got the opportunity to sit down and do some dinners and lunches with Richard C and um, honestly he's not the friendliest guy in the world mm. um, he's very standoffish uh, he doesn't you know he's he socializes with his clique only everybody else um he's you know kind of a jackass honestly <laughs> um so but yeah i mean i thought he was the greatest thing since sliced toast and you know i thought I, my books autographed by him and um all that stuff but uh i see now that that he absolutely knew what he was doing you know really uh, oh yeah oh that's a crusher yeah. I'm not a fan of his anymore, but back when I lived in, uh, at one point I lived in Napa, California, and I worked at a radio station there, the AM station, KVON, for anybody who keeps track of radio stations. Mm -hmm. It was a small AM uh, news talk, and I had a show on which was called Plugged In. And that was my first talk show that I did, and I was everything. I screened the calls, took them live on the air, figured out what guests I wanted, booked my guests, and basically scrubbed the toilets and took out the trash. I'm exaggerating on that <laughs> part, but you know, in big radio stations, there's somebody else who does everything for you. You just sit down and talk. This was a small station, but uh, I was interested in, at the time, due to listening to Art what Bell back then, all of these different people, and I ended up interviewing on the phone Richard C. Hoagland, and he was nice enough to me for my one-hour interview, and it was mm -hmm. informative, and he sent me a book, and I no longer have that book, but uh, yeah, I was uh, down with all of that, thought all of that was real. But then when you think about it, he got the pictures from NASA. So yes. 
And he was supposedly a, you know, a consultant. NASA insider. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a NASA insider. Was that book by any chance um, Monuments of Mars that he sent you? I don't remember because I would have to look it up at the time frame that I was working at that station, but it was in the, it was in the early 90s, so. Right, that makes sense. Yeah, I actually spent some time also working uh, as an engineer for a KSPN in Aspen, Colorado. Oh, wow. It's a TV station there. Uh -huh. So did some engineering work out there too, but uh, that was only for, I don't know, five or six months, something like that. So you were the radio station engineer? Television station. Oh, television. I'm sorry, you did say that. Yes. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. and I, I used to work on uh, the, the transmitters up on the mountaintops. Of course, I spent mm -hmm. a lot of time up on Lookout Mountain here in Colorado. Um, in fact, it, the one time I got really close to being struck by lightning um, was I was working up at uh, Lookout Mountain on one of the transmitters up there. And uh, it, I was, it, the, the storm had come in and all of a sudden all the hair on my arms just stood up and I knew what that meant. And I bailed inside the transmitter shack and bam, this lightning strike came down, scared the crud out of me. <laughs> <Funny>. <laughs> so, yeah. I, uh, uh, I was on a show today, which is the Morgal show. He started, uh, I think it's called Static Plane, but I've got that name kind of wrong. But it's on his the Morgal channel, and he's been doing it every Saturday. And starts at, I believe, 2 p.m. Central Time. Um, I only say Central because I'm on Central Time here in Houston, Texas. But uh, he does this panel show, and I'm one of the people. And I only stay on a short time because then I come and do this Um with whomever my guest is, luckily you today. And he was talking about at one point when he was young, uh, getting electrocuted, and he was theorizing what happens when you get electrocuted if it does something to your brain, making you potentially a weirdo and interested in flat earth. <laughs> no, could. That's no. not exactly where he was going with it, but kind of. So, uh, uh, you know, the Morgyle and yourself and Jaron are going into your second season of Globusters, beginning on Sunday, right? Tomorrow. Yep. Tomorrow, yeah. Yes. So Globusters has changed since in inception and morphed into where it is right now. So mm -hmm. tell us about where it's been, where it's going, what your role has, your role's changed definitely. Yes, yes my role has changed. Well, the way that uh, this kind of happened um, is Jaron was always kind of a big fan of my comments that I would write um, because I would, you know, purposely do very thoughtful comments. Mm. And, I've seen uh, your comments, they are. Yes, and thank you. <laughs> Sometimes I get a little rambunctious, but you yes, know. <laughs> I like that too. You're either very informative, very kind, or let's use the word rambunctious. <laughs> or, or a flat Earth asshole. Right? I was just going to say that. <laughs> so um, yeah, so I was uh, on the chat one day on the Jaronism chat, and Jaron popped in and he goes, "Hey, I want to do a Q and A." And he asked uh, TJ and myself if we wanted mm -hmm. to do it, and TJ couldn't make it uh, at that point. So I'm like, sure, what the heck, I'll back you up on it, because you know, he knew that I had a lot of technical knowledge and, and uh, wanted me there to kind of back him up. And we didn't really take too many questions. We wound up talking about so many different things um, that we didn't really get too many questions. And, and I remember that day, um, Stephen Christopher was actually in the chat. Oh, yes. And we were kind of going back and forth with him on that. And uh, so then he goes, oh, hey, maybe we could do this a couple more times. And so we said, OK, I said, OK, let's let's do it. And and before you knew it, it was a weekly thing. And then, uh, you know, TJ had come on board with us at that time. And uh, um, then we started doing the ISS show. So we were doing it, you know, twice a week at that point. It was running, you know, three to four hours per show. So we were getting a lot of airtime in. And uh has just kind of kept going and going and going and now uh, uh, tomorrow starts our season two and we have cut it back to one day a week for the time being we'll probably still do you know kind of impromptu broadcasts and stuff like that right. but honestly it's very difficult to come up with a, a, you know quality material um, to talk about um, you know twice a week and, and fill that many hours and we both felt that you know we could be doing other things that are much more beneficial a you know my research for one yeah, working week. on the model working on the model and trying to get that out rather than just trying to come up with guests and things to talk about um, so we decided we you know cut back on the time and maybe do three Jaron wants to do four hours um, tomorrow I don't know if we're gonna do that or not but uh, I thought it was uh, noon to 230 tomorrow Pacific time. Right. That's the, that was the original time that we yeah. had set. But, you know, right. Darren was talking about doing four hours. I think three is 
a little bit better, you know, figure to go about. And of course, we can always run it a little bit longer, mm -hmm. um, you know, if we have something super interesting. And he wants to break it up into to sections where we do more Q and A, um, and then we'll have a guest, and we won't necessarily have the guest on the entire time. And we'll have just basically the show will be broken up into different segments. It's a great idea, actually. I like that idea, yeah. and uh, it can be done very well when you have several people on a show. Yes, you know. It, me, my show, it wouldn't really work as well. But when I do a show with Mark every Monday, we call it the secret show. If we were to do a different sort of show than we do, we could do that, breaking it up into sections. So, right. yeah, that's a very, it's like radio actually was when I was in radio. Um, yeah. You know, I'd start off with taking the news at the top of the hour and then at five after, after a commercial breaks, very annoying commercials usually, um, come <laughs> on and intro the guests, greet the guests, talk about their book or whatever do a little talk, go to a break, come back, and then, you know, like break up the hour into, you know, segments. We're we've got the guest from, you know, noon to 1230. And then after that, we've got, you know, uh, call lot taking callers and that sort of thing. Makes it fun for those who are, in radio's case, uh, listening, but listening and watching to have it like that, to yeah. look forward to, oh, I can't wait till Q&A comes on or Oh, I like this interview with this guest. So yep, I think absolutely. it's going to be a good idea that you guys are doing your new yeah. format. And of course, uh, as you know, I, I uh, took over the show as primary host, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, a couple months ago, something like that. Because, you know, Jaron called me one night and he goes, you know, it just seems like when we're on, um, I'll start it and then I'll just kind of defer to you for everything. Yeah, so he goes, sometimes he would just almost disappear. He'd be like, where's Jaron? <laughs> <laughs> You know, and I'm just rambling on and stuff, you know, talking about stuff. What and, happens when you're too good? You end up becoming the main host. <laughs> oh, jeez, yeah. Well, you know, and of course, this is not my forte. I mean, I was never, I'd never done anything like this before. And that's why it's hard, you know, to come up with material and things to talk about. And of course, mm -hmm. as the show, uh, the, the host of the show, you know, you're kind of the one that has to keep it going and think of things to come up with. And, and that's where, honestly, Patricia, I have a huge amount of respect for you because I had no idea how hard this was to actually do, at least for me, um, until I started doing it. And you do it with such incredible ease and you just make it look so easy. Um, I really like that about you. <laughs> Thank you. Right back at you. You're amazing. So I don't want this to disintegrate into, although it probably already has a love fest, but <laughs> yeah, you know, um, I'm a super big fan of Jaren's. I don't even want to say fan. I consider him a friend. Missa, yes. she's great. You and, and, and John the Morgyle. There's just so many great people in Flat Earth. It's, uh, you know, there's the bad people. Yeah, we all kind of read comments from them and hear about things they're doing and see videos. They're not bad people, actually. But sometimes they just act bad. Right. And I just say to myself that either they're, they're missing out on the greatest thing that's probably ever happened in their life. And I know probably the birth of their children and falling in love would rank right up there, maybe even more so. But it's one of the greatest things, this Flat Earth Awakening. Oh, uh, it's I've never, you know, there's been these other conspiracies starting with, you know, Kennedy assassination when I was born, uh, when I was small. I mean, these are huge things that have changed the course of history and all 9-11, et cetera. But this is, this is different. This is different. Yeah. It's what we stand on. Yeah. And, you know, I, I look at them and, and sometimes, you know, like I said, I get a little rambunctious and, you know, but I think back and I say, you know, a little over a year ago or right around a year ago, I was in the same position. I would have said anybody that would have told me that the earth was flat, I would have just looked at him and went, right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and just thought that they were, you know, an, an utter idiot. Um, so I guess being right. there, we've would all you been have there. gone so far to open up a YouTube channel? Yes. Go about making horrible comments and make videos making fun of the YouTubers that were coming up with yeah. flat earth proofs. You probably wouldn't have gone that far. No, I would not have. And, that and honestly, it's a special kind of person. <laughs> it does. And I don't understand the people that do that. And of course, and we know who we're talking about when we mm -hmm. talk about these people. And it's like, you know, why? Um, are, are, are they being paid to do this? Maybe. I don't know. I don't have any proof of that. But it just seems to me that that if somebody doesn't believe in something or they don't you know agree with the idea uh if i was in that position i would never go to you know these channels and just call them people morons and you know get in these arguments and 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 do it and not just one time but these people do it every single day it's like their life 
And it's like, I just don't understand that. It's, it just blows me away. So the only thing I can think of is that either the biggest losers on earth because they have no life or they're being paid to do it. I don't know. Yeah. I may be wrong. I don't know. But it just seems so weird to me that, that people actually act like that. And I honestly wonder what's going on inside of their head. You know, they will say, well, I'm just trying to save you, uh, save everybody from your rhetoric and your, your bad information. It's like, you know, less than 1% of the planet would even give you the time of day, you know, if you said the earth is flat, you know, let alone you know, try and come back and battle you over it. Um, so that that behavior just really puzzles me. Yeah, I don't get it either. I think it's in some way. Uh, this is a weird one. Lack of lack of love, self love, and maybe feeling that others love them. Something. So they need to act out and get attention. Yeah, in some, some way. Somebody posted a thing on Facebook um, a few days ago that was talking about. Um, people that are, are trolls and, and their mentality that's going on. And actually, when I read it, it made a lot of sense to me. Um, but it's it's hard to relate to because I'm not that way myself. What did it and, say? Uh, oh, I can't remember specifically what the details were, but they get, um, there's it's it's the fact that they're getting acknowledged at all. Yeah, uh, yeah over, that's it. It's the love thing, I think. Yeah, yeah. So and that's it, why they say don't feed the trolls. Exactly. And that's, you know, there's there's a, there's a guy that that has you know he may be in the chat right now for all I know mm. um, but uh, I don't ever I, see my chat so I don't know <laughs> I always watch it but I'm not watching it now because I just uh, said I don't want to be distracted right. by it so yeah. I'm not watching the, the chat right now but but now uh, oh, geez I forgot what I was going with that <laughs> see you get distracted you weren't even watching the chat <laughs> yeah, that's see, why I don't watch my chat before I set my show up before it actually begins I can go into chat and say we're gonna be delayed five minutes or hello everybody and mm -hmm. then I get out of that screen and then I just go, you know, like this. But I've been criticized by people saying that I don't monitor the chat or don't answer questions in chat. I can't. I would lose my right. train of thought just like you did there. If you have several people on the show at the same time with varying screens, you can do it. Or if you're willing to actually have a show where you're like, let's go into chat. Okay. And then a lot of dead time, dead air. Right. But I, I don't want to do that. So. Right. Oh, I remember what I was going to say. Um, Good. <laughs> this this well-known troll told me one time. He goes, the thing you'd never want to do is you never want to acknowledge a troll. I mean, I have it in email from the guy, right? And plus he said it in the chats. I know so this particular wanna... person because yes. they've also emailed me. Yes. And so I follow that advice, you know, when he comes on and he starts antagonizing or stuff like that. I won't acknowledge him, or, or sometimes I will if I'm in a rare mood, but for the most part, I don't answer his emails, I won't acknowledge him in chat, I simply will not acknowledge him on his own advice, right? So who can fault me for that? <laughs> I've responded to email before to that person because I really at that point thought they were a real person that had legitimate concerns. Then I learned a little bit different later on, and that's fine. Uh, probably never should have responded, but just like Mark Sargent shouldn't have answered a certain troll's phone call yes. that came out of the blue, but Mark was just trying to help somebody. And then that particular phone call got presented as interview with Mark Sargent when it was more like random phone call without permission recorded with Mark Sargent. <laughs> so, exactly, exactly. So, uh, yeah. But yeah, it's it's unfortunate, and I seriously do not understand that. And and uh, he continues to make videos to this day, as far as I and know. And several videos saying it was he's not going to be involved with flat Earth anymore. And I've received several emails that said he's out of flat Earth. He's going to leave everybody yeah. alone. Then I see a new video, <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. what? Yeah, yeah. It's really weird. And that and that really concerns me because um, one thing I'm I'm glad about is uh, Learn of the Jesuit Order appears to be back. He's um, back, yes. And oh, that's a mystery, isn't it? Yeah, and, but he's not picking on the ISS so much. And of course, right. I, I got you know one thing I will tell you about the Globebuster show is we are going to go full force on the ISS. I've got so much material on <laughs> this that it's ridiculous. Um, so yeah, but. Uh, um, yeah, I um, love learning the Jesuit order really yeah. love his work loved all of his ISS stuff and was saddened when he came out uh, recently for those who don't know with um, basically it was a meme it looked like a picture of a dandelion that had been blown by the wind and some kind of statement under it one of those inspirational poster statements that didn't seem like at all in the nature of learn of the Jesuit order if you've ever right. heard his videos saying something like I don't even remember what it said but whatever it said rang false to me like why is he putting that up there and then he did a voiceover on the video saying 
saying that he was wrong about the ISS and he was wrong about the U.S. and the Soviet Union and they are doing real science up there. He's not really sure and satellites are real. And everybody was just, oh my gosh, it's Tiger Dan 2.0 going on here. What's happening? Has he been compromised? Has somebody got to him? Has somebody threatened his family or something? And I, I, you know, I was sad to see him go. I felt bad for him because no matter what he wasn't happy you could tell in the video the way his voice was and yeah. then he disappeared and i thought gone forever sad and uh, then boom he popped back up with a couple of videos but like you said not attacking the iss yeah. what's your take yeah. on what the real story is well you know i don't know um maybe you know maybe he truly does believe that there are some things that are that are viable for the ISS but you know when he first did that obviously the first thing that crossed my mind is like oh my god here goes another person mm -hmm. you know Tiger Dan did it um, Jamie uh, uh, mm -hmm. fake space band in space mm -hmm. and but what's weird about it is, now Tiger Dan is kind of backed off but I mean um, like Jamie for example mm -hmm. this guy is completely all over it you know mm -hmm. he he's kind of you know t taken the that troll position where he's attacking everybody um, it's like, why don't you just walk away from this? If you don't believe that, that it's real and you think it's this much of a psyop or whatever. Oh, and, and the reason that I think that he, he decided to stop doing it is he got some, uh, his dad got some bad threats or something like that. Yes, he said his father saw his, Jamie was speaking of, um, used to be fake space, man in face, space, then a lot of other names and then fake space cadet currently. Right. Um, he said his father had received had seen his videos and thought his son was crazy and you know i'm like well don't make videos like that then <laughs> yeah and, and, but god talk about overcompensate you know to completely mm -hmm. go around and now attack everybody it's just like again i don't get that you know that doesn't right. make any sense to me um you know if if i ever got to the point where i didn't believe in the model and walked away first of all i would say why okay me too i would do a video <laughs> looking right in everyone's eyes saying look here's what I found out about the fact that we live on a globe. Let me show you these things right now. And I would also talk with friends of mine in Flat Earth behind the scenes and say, hey, you know, I've got these issues. I got these problems. Can you help me figure them out? Um, right. I would never come on and tell people they were stupid for believing in it, make fun of people, make videos, making fun of people's videos. Just this, No one's ever going to wake up on Flat Earth one morning and find out Patricia Steer has done a video making fun of another Flat Earther. It's never going to happen right or and, a globe earther even and if it did happen the only thing that i would think at that point is that somebody got to them that mm -hmm. threatened them threatened their family yes. um you know and i've talked about that before it's like you know if if somebody threatens me that's one thing but you know if the if some government agency or something like that you know came after me threatening to harm my family and i believed that it was a legitimate threat I would probably change my tune, you know, but yeah, you'd, you'd really have to sadly yeah, enough. Yeah. But short because of that, you've got a family. Now, if you don't have a family, you could just say, make me. <laughs> yeah. Bring it, you know, whatever. Yeah. But, you know, we have other people that, you know, I'm responsible for, you know, I have a family and, mm -hmm. and uh, of course I would hope that it would never come to that. But, but, you know, I try and imagine these scenarios as to what could possibly cause these people to do these dramatic mm -hmm. turnabouts. Um, and go on the offensive. That's the thing that really gets me. You know, it's one thing to just stop believing in it, but to go on the offensive is just, wow. <laughs> if there is somebody who would come and threaten your family and say, you better stop talking about Flat Earth or we're going to off X, Y, and Z and name some family members. Uh, if, if, it was, if you could just say, okay, I'll quit. I'll take my channel down and then just disappear into the woodwork. That's one thing. But it seems to be that you've if indeed these are people being asked to step right. out, they're being also asked to start making fun of it, belittling it, and tearing it apart at the same time. Yeah. So that's the part that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't. None me. of it makes any sense to me. And so I tend to believe that they're not actually being threatened, mm -hmm. and they're not controlled. Maybe there's some kind of level of some people have said demonic possession or something. I don't know about any of that, but uh, whatever it is, I just certainly hope that uh, it ends soon. Mm -hmm. And it's good to know Lerner, the Jesuit order, is back and he's alive and he's doing videos, still making fun of NASA. And see, that part took away the, oh, he must be paid. Because why would the powers that should not be say, you can make fun of NASA, but just don't talk about the ISS. Right. So that proves to me that he actually did look at some of his videos and think, 
there may be some flaws here with some of the things I've presented. Maybe the ISS is up there. Maybe there are satellites. Mm -hmm. Well, there's there's definitely something up there. Um, you know, I've seen it myself several times. Um, you know, I, I get the notices, you know, spot mm -hmm. the station. I've seen I'll Jaren on, on the show run outside to go look at it. <laughs> yeah, me too. And I, I try and photograph it. Um, I, what do you see? I've seen the photos people have taken, and sometimes it's a bright light, and sometimes it's that thing that looks like it's the shape of the ISS, which to me seems impossible that right. far away. Well, th and that's part of the things that I'm going to be exposing on Globebusters. But um, what I see is nothing more than a brilliant light. Um, mm -hmm. Even when I get close on it, it's still, you know, just a blurry light, but it's very brilliant. Um, now, I have friends, in fact, CD, I don't know if you know his channel or mm -hmm. not. C-E-E-D-E. -E. Um, yep c e e d e e um c d does moon t v and he has not only caught the lunar wave twice but uh, just the other day he got some actual resolution out of the i s s and um that was kind of fascinating i mean you couldn't tell a lot, but you could kind of tell that you know it looked like something with wings and a tail section and empennage and stuff like that and I was looking at it and and I made a request of him, and he's actually going to carry this out uh i said c d can you take footage of a plane that's at roughly um, 35,000 feet um, using the same magnification you used on your scope um, and let's do a comparison because the ISS is just a little bit bigger than a 747. Uh, as I'd say it's about 25 to 30 percent larger. Okay so I'm looking at that and I'm thinking okay so 35,000 feet is about uh, six miles, six and a half miles, something like that and if the ISS is what I think it is, and I think that it's probably like a, a U-2 spy plane that's been modified, mm -hmm. uh, it's probably flying at around 60,000 feet. I believe that what they've done is they've taken some super high intensity LED lamps and mounted it um, to the bottom of the either the uh, engine pods or, you know, like along the empennade section of the, um, the tail, which is the tail section. And that's what you're actually seeing hmm. um, when it flies over. In fact, I'm almost certain of it. So I spent this entire last couple of days digging up footage of um, supposed amateur shots um, of the ISS. And when you look at the amateur shots that are clearly amateur shots, it looks a lot like that that thing that was going around on Facebook. I think uh, who was it? Uh, Joseph Clymera actually came out with it first. Right, right. Wherever he his, is now. <laughs> yeah, wherever he is now. And and it looked like that it was a U-2 spy plane with this light array on the bottom of it. And they fly at about 60,000 feet, and I spec them out, and they go about 500 miles an hour. And uh, these things are not going, you know, super gangbuster speed. In fact, I live very close to DIA, so I see a lot of aircraft going, you know, around, and it's not going a whole lot faster. So anyway, I was looking at all these different um, uh, amateur shots of it, and then I looked at some that were supposed to be amateur that came out of Russia that were no way were they amateur, right? Um, they were clearly, uh, they were clearly professional, and they were also clearly CGI. Yeah, and it looks like a perfectly lit, bright model in yeah, the sky. Yeah, totally and stable. Totally yes. stable. How did you get that shot? <laughs> yeah, impossible. Um, and then there was another one where it, it looked like it was kind of flipping around in circles. Uh, yes, saw that one too recently. But, but that was that was nothing more than a loop. Okay, that mm. was just the same video footage going in a loop. Oh. So. So I looked at that, but then there was another guy in there who who does CGI fakery, and that's something his name is related to that, where all he does is CGI fake stuff. And so he took a shot at doing the ISS in CGI, and it looked precisely like this guy in Germany's footage that did that I know absolutely is a fake. And you could see all this detail. You could actually see um, one of the shuttles docked with it. And I'm just looking at that going, there is no way that this can happen. <laughs> so uh, I figured that, you know, one of the best ways to actually disprove this is to, to get perspective shots from the ground of Makes whatever sense. that is that's flying up there and, you know, versus aircraft that we know and say, okay, is it really... Um, 38 times further away. Um, I don't believe it for a second. I don't believe that you can see an object the size of a football field 250 miles away. I don't care how bright it is. Um, so I've come up with several different ideas on how it can be debunked, and this is one of them, and CD is going to be carrying this out. And we're going to be kind of making this a, a continuing theme um, besides uh, watching the ISS, but also, you know, finding out really clever ways to um, debunk it. I'd really like to get the funding you know at some point but i'm hesitant to try and start any funding because of all the 
crap oh, that goes along with it. Yes, I know. You'll be accused of being a sellout and a show. I know. I know. Which is ridiculous. I, I will say right now, anybody who wants to monetize their channel, I monetize mine. Trust me, you don't make any money uh, really at all being a flat earther. Yeah. Uh, or, or have a Patreon account. I don't. Other people do. Or PayPal or a subscription-based show. Thumbs up to that. Because yeah. if it's your passion, making money from your passion, small amount, of course, why yeah. not? Isn't that everyone's dream? Yeah. And, and honestly, Globebusters uh, doesn't get that much. And, and their biggest reason is because we're always showing different videos on Globebusters. And so, mm -hmm. bam, already monetized or whatever, you know, and we never get any revenue off of it. So I think, you know, to get $100 a month would be doing really good, right, yeah. on the Globebusters. And, but that's okay because, like I said, we're not in it for the money. We're in it to expose you know the fraud that's going on with nasa and the iss and and all the other things that are going on in the world so um but yeah so getting back to the point um i had come up with an idea that wouldn't it be cool if we could charter a flight um with you know somebody that's turbojet rated i'm not turbojet rated on my pilot's license um so i can't actually fly an aircraft that will go high enough to be able to to photograph the iss but uh, I thought it would be great if we could charter a flight uh, at, at a time that it was going to fly over and actually get some high altitude flights of it and, and chase it if we could. You know, wow. Just, yeah. <laughs> but uh, then we looked into it. Uh, one of the guys, uh, one of our listeners actually looked into it and the price was outrageous. And I mean, there's a potential that you'd get shut down. Maybe that's conspiratorial, but... They don't maybe. want us to know that whatever it is, is, is not the ISS. Yeah, but I, I'm not too worried about that because a lot of time, I mean, I'm out right out here by DIA and it comes over the top of us, which means it's got to be going right over DIA. So I don't think that anybody flying in the area, you know, especially above the terminal control area um, would be, you know, shot down or anything like that. But if we pursued it, that may be a little bit different thing going on wow but, it sounds like a james bond movie <laughs> oh totally but wouldn't it be great you know if we could yes. actually get close enough to definitively see that this is a u2 that's been modified that would be awesome and so maybe someday we'll be able to do that i don't know but uh there's a lot of other ways to to debunk it and uh you know that's exactly where well, we're going to be going debunking from the inside is interesting a really good video recently by david weiss who comes out with good videos all the time but this one was where he showed an old clip from penn and teller doing a magic show on a i think a late night tv show where it appears that they're inside some sort of a stand that says penn and teller across the top on a little banner and they're both there and they do these magic tricks and uh, a lot of the objects float you know up and go away and and that sort of thing and mm -hmm. Then the camera pulls away and it shows they're hanging upside down from gravity boots and things that are going up really are actually just dropping on the ground. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, he also interspersed that with cuts from the ISS and then sort of took the shots from the ISS and then turned, David did, turned them upside down. And you can kind of almost see veins popping out in their foreheads and the straining that they do and little glitches. And then there's that video that came out by, uh, I don't know who made it, but it's for the band OK Go. Go. OK yes. Go. Yes. yes. And they had this song and it was all filmed and they admitted this, of course, not on the ISS, but on uh, one of those, um, I don't know, Vomit Comet planes. And they did it in sections uh, with the singers in the band and then some extras playing air hostess slash stewardesses um, with all sorts of balls floating around and fun, brightly colored things. And then their music playing as a music video mm -hmm. and they filmed it on this thing. But if you watch the music video, it's quite long and they can only maintain on the vomit comet that anti-gravity for like 22 seconds or something, mm -hmm. something along those lines. And they said in this video, the making of the OK Go video that they could quote morph the sections together to create a really long video mm -hmm. and that made me think hmm it might be one of the things that they're doing on the iss along with harnesses sometimes or green screen sometimes i think they use a variety of methods did you see the uh, comment by nasa on that video no <laughs> yeah. i didn't somebody from nasa one of the nasa space centers actually commented on it um, saying that, oh, well, you have to do this in several takes, you know, like they were authoritative on it. Of course, they would be, right? 
Interesting. But yeah, that blew me away to see that. Somebody sent that to me and said, look, you know, check it out. And there's, you know, right now there's about 30,000 comments on it. But NASA's trolling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And But what you were saying was right, because that's something I thought of also. It's like, you know, magicians do this stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at Chris Angel or, or David Blaine. You know, Chris mm -hmm. Angel, you know, basically made an entire casino levitate, right? I don't know how he did it, but if a magician can do it, you think NASA wouldn't be able to do something like that? You know, it's they could have even hired magicians to get some tricks together. Absolutely. Wouldn't put it past them. Absolutely. You know, so, yeah, I mean, you know, people are trying to come up with these explanations um, technically, and some of the explanations will probably never understand or never know. I mean, some of them would be magicians trade secrets, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. There's also other very logical things that that it could be as well. Um, so, you know, to I'll be tell you what it's by, not. It's not what they say it is. No, it's not. No, it's absolutely we know it's that. Not. So, and we can say that about everything involving flat Earth. It's not what we've been told. That's right. There's more than meets the eye. It's kind of like a Transformers, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Like the Transformers moon buggy that was on the Apollo mission that just somehow folded out. But there's no video yeah. of that. And then just drove around on the moon. No problem. Yep. yep. It's amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Bob, for being my guest. So you're on tomorrow, and henceforth, uh, we've got uh, Globusters going into the second season on YouTube, on the Globusters channel, with you, Jaron, and the Morgyle, and that is noon Pacific time till 2.30, or maybe a little bit later, every mm -hmm. Sunday. What about the, uh, the ISS? When are you doing that? Well, I think we're going to kind of integrate that into the show. Um, maybe okay. people like to have something to look at, um, you know, and we don't. This is true. Yeah, we don't necessarily, you know, show our faces or our guest faces. And that's not because we don't want to show our face. But um, honestly, we think the things that we present on screen um, are much more interesting to look at, you know. I, uh, I agree with that. I, I, <laughs> no, but I mean, I don't show diagrams. So, you know, some of right. my guests occasionally. But uh, yeah, so different shows, different strokes for different folks. Yeah, yeah we just do it a little different, different way. So, uh, but uh, yeah, it should be, should be a good season. I'm looking forward to it. All right. Well, thank you for having uh, your son, Jaron, on, your wife, Cammie. And I, I, I've had a wonderful time talking with you, as I knew I would. <laughs> uh, ditto. <laughs> thank <laughs> it's you so much. Zana Dude on with us today on Flat Earth and Other Hobbit Tales. It's Bob. Check him out on Globusters tomorrow, which is going to be the 28th of 2015, February, excuse me, 2016, <laughs> February. And uh, as I always say when I close out my show, keep it flat.